So I'm going to be talking about how we at the UCSF Global Health Group have been using Earth Engine to automate the production of risk maps uh, for malaria. So what do I mean by risk maps? Um, well, diseases aren't everywhere. They are only in places where humans, <coughs> pathogen, and the vector, what I mean by vector is the, the thing that spreads the disease, mosquitoes, in the case of malaria, where these three, three things overlap. Their distributions are dependent on a set of variables, environmental and climate variables. Things like temperature, precipitation, land use, all control the distribution of these three things. And where they overlap, we get risk. We get disease risk. And that risk manifests itself in disease. And we observe disease uh, through surveys or through surveillance. So if we, if we know where disease and when diseases are occurring, and we have information on these environmental factors, then using statistical models, we can generate a, a map, a layer of risk. This is analogous to sort of species distribution modeling. So in, instead of cases, uh, observe incidents of cases, we might have species of birds or fungi or any other uh, living thing that is dependent on environmental factors. And you can use modeling to then produce these sort of habitat suitability maps. And these are the same sorts of principles that we use in, FP, in epidemiology. So now there are, with the advent of remotely sensed data, there are numerous examples of risk maps out there. Um, on the left here, this is a map of schistosomiasis, a really nasty worm infection uh, in Mali, uh, which again uses uh, environmental variables, temperature, distance to water bodies. Over here we have uh, a risk map of intestinal worms in Kenya um, by some colleagues at London School. Um, the, uh, in the malaria space, there's been a lot of work on risk maps, and this is a map uh, from the Malaria Atlas Project, uh, a fantastic uh, a group that have put together uh, information from survey data on malaria to produce a global picture uh, of malaria prevalence, infection. And, and at smaller scales, co colleagues at the Clinton Health Access Initiative um, have gone down into much finer resolution to, to try to predict malaria in Swaziland. Uh, and what you can see here is that there are really, really small hotspots of, uh, of risk in certain areas of the country. So these risk maps, why do we risk map? Well, risk maps are useful for planning intervention campaigns and for, for controlling disease. If you know where, which populations at risk, then you can deliver your interventions in, in an efficient, cost-effective way. So in Swaziland, their main interventions, their main methods of preventing controlling and treating malaria are case detection. So every time an individual comes to a facility and is diagnosed with malaria, that individual is traced back to their village and others in the village, in the local area, are tested. And if they're positive, they're treated. And this is an activity that goes on year round as cases come in. They also spray houses with insecticide. So they leave insecticide on the inside of walls. And every time a mosquito lands on it, it kills, in, it in theory, kills the mosquito. And they distribute insecticide-treated mosquito nets to protect the population at night while they sleep. So these risk maps can be used to help target and plan the delivery of these, these three main interventions in Swaziland. But generating risk maps like this is a challenge. Uh, and updating them at a, meaningful, uh, at a meaningful rate is difficult. So we were motivated to see whether we could work with the Swazi Malaria Control Program and with the Clinton Health Access Initiative to develop a platform that would essentially automate this whole process. So programs, malaria control programs, they're collecting information on where they see malaria. Can they load this or have it automatically fed into a platform and at the click of a button generate a risk map that can be updated in real time? So we were very fortunate to be awarded a uh, Earth Engine Research Award to try to develop a prototype system. And for the moment, we're calling this DISARM, the Disease Surveillance and Risk Mapping Platform. And what I'm going to do now is actually just flick to Earth Engine and show you the platform 
as it stands. OK. So here we have, can everyone see that? Yeah, OK. I can zoom out a little bit. So here we have Swaziland, a small country in southern Africa. I can switch to satellite view here. Now in Swaziland, they have a, they have a very good surveillance system. So every time an individual is diagnosed with malaria, they go, the team is sent off to their village, and they take a GPS point at the household. So we can map these cases, and these have been obfuscated for uh, confidentiality reasons. Now these are local cases, so every time a case comes in, they interview that person to establish whether they got their infection at their place of residence or whether they traveled. So we also know the location of all the imported cases as well in the country. And you can see that those cluster over here, which is where main cities are. Now in Earth Engine, we have access to all of the layers that we believe are related to the distribution of malaria. So things like elevation, so high elevation in the west and low elevation in the east. I'll turn these off so you can see. Uh, NDWI, which is, uh, most of you know is a water index, uh, an index of moisture. EVI, which is related to vegetation, which again is sort of related to water and precipitation. Uh, things like slope, which affect water runoff, which affect uh, the ability for water to collect and form pools for mosquitoes. Uh, to breed in. Temperature is another one. And we can use a whole suite of other variables like distance to water bodies um, and access to healthcare. And then in Earth Engine, we essentially run using the, the inbuilt classifiers, using random forest models. We compare the locations of cases to locations where there's no malaria. And we can sample those using a population, uh, a population layer, and that's here. So this is uh, data from the WorldPot project, which I believe is now um, being ingested by Earth Engine. Uh, so we can sample from this background of points and then compare the conditions at malaria cases uh, to those uh, places where there's no malaria. And that then allows us to pr predict um, through space and through time malaria risk. So this is the current level of risk, June this year. Red areas, high risk, down to these uh, areas of very low risk. But because in Earth Engine we have access to this full catalog back in time, we can drill down for every single case what was the rainfall in that month or in the preceding month or the prior month. Same for temperature and other time-varying factors. And that then allows us to generate these risk maps through time. So this is just an animation of risk from January last year through to the present day. And what this shows us is that risk is variable through time. So some places see relatively consistently high levels of risk, but in other areas of the country, risk is more variable. So interventions like case detection, where you're following cases back and screening people in the area, might only be profitable, might only be useful at certain times of the year. So the program can actually use these maps to help prioritize which cases they should be following up and where they should be screening for more infections. But in terms of the other interventions that they do, so spraying with insecticide uh, and giving out uh, mosquito nets, these are done annually. So they need to know uh, over the year which areas are at risk over longer periods of time. So we can actually ask Earth Engine uh, to show us um, areas that are at high risk for at least four months of the year. So these are the really hotspot areas. These are the areas that we need to be targeting with our interventions and working from there. But these are just areas that are ecologically suitable, ecologically high risk. So we can actually filter out using this population layer, which is 100 meter resolution native, we can filter out those areas where there's no one living. And now we're just left with these, essentially these high-risk populations. So this information is then useful for planning where to start spraying, where to start giving out these insecticide-treated nets. But it's also useful retrospectively to establish and monitor and evaluate where you've distributed your interventions relative to risk. 
So every time a net is given out in Swaziland, they take a GPS of the household, so we can load that data in. So this every, every black point represents a household that received a net. And what you can see is that Swaziland's given out a lot of nets, but they've also, there are some patches that are at high risk where nets were not distributed. And if we zoom in, we can actually see these are, that the data that we have, the WorldPOP data and these risk maps are actually picking out very high resolution, these houses that are at high risk but haven't received nets. So this information could be useful for sort of mop-up campaigns and for establishing how good your distribution of nets was relative to, to risk. So I'm just going to flip back to, to this. So I've, I've given you a quick sort of preview of where we are in terms of um, the Earth Engine back end. Our next step is to, to build a front end, and we're working with a group called Visuality who helped to develop the Global Forest Watch front end. And this will sort of connect with Google Earth back end uh, and provide the user with a sort of more user friendly um, interface. So they'll be able to do things like select areas and run statistics. And in fact, we've learned today that that's a lot of that's possible in Earth Engine, which is fantastic. Uh, we also want to work out how this platform, how this technology plugs into other bits of technology. So there's an open source bit of software called DHIS2, and there's some um, representation from DHIS2 here today. DHIS2 is an open source bit of software that is used to aggregate, manage, and visualize disease surveillance data. It's now used in, in a number of countries. So the question is, can our fancy risk mapping platform essentially plug in? Can we, can we essentially insert it into DHIS2? And I'm hoping that clever developers at the back say yes. We also want to think about mobile applications. So if we're generating these risk maps and all of this information, it's, only, it's not useful if it's just generated on a laptop in an office. We want to be able to communicate with team members, people in the field. We want to be able to send them the risk maps so that they can go to these individual houses and give out nets and mop up. So we're looking at ways to build or build on mobile applications. And we've just come across actually GeoODK, um, which I, I'm not sure if it's an extension from UW or if there's someone else who's modified it, but we have no experience with GeoODK. But if anyone does, we'd be really interested to hear from them. Or if uh, people have other ideas about open source apps we can build on. Uh, we also want to think about other functions, other data that can be fed into this. So there's been a lot of work uh, recently uh, by colleagues at the University of Southampton, Andy Tatum and others, using cell phone records to infer human movement. So every time someone places a call or uh, sends a text, you can locate that phone to a tower. So if you aggregate that data, you can actually look at movement patterns. So this is movement of human, uh, human movement in Namibia. Now, if you've got information on where people move, you can overlay a risk map generated from the, mean, the, the methods I've just talked about. And that then allows you to start to look at sources and sinks. So you might have two, what look like two hotspots, but actually one is just feeding the other. So if you can differentiate those, then if you hit the source with an intervention, that could have a knock-on effect in the sink. So this is some intriguing um, research that hopefully we could include. Then there's other things like health facility level data as layers, which could include information on stock levels of drugs and diagnostics, and even entomology data, so information on mosquitoes that's collected separately. Then we're also interested in other uh, sources of data, like the locations of structures. So if you know where every structure is, then your field teams can go around tag those structures, they can spray and check them off. And this is a, 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 a campaign that we have with Tomnod. Tomnod is a division of Dig Digital Globe. Uh, it is their crowdsourcing platform. So we essentially have set up this campaign where volunteers around the world look through high-resolution imagery 
and map out footprints of buildings. I think there's something like 30,000 volunteers currently doing this, and we've mapped 100,000 structures so far. But this information can then be fed into the, into the platform. It would be great to think about ways to speed this up, and I'm sure some clever people in the audience have some ideas, uh, because at the moment, while this gives us probably very accurate information, it does take a long time. Uh, we also want to think about how we can build in uh, models to change, convert our risk maps to decision maps or recommendation maps. So rather than just presenting a program with information on levels of risk, inf you know, risk might be 0 0.23, well, what does that mean? Operationally, can we make some recommendation? So we're working with um, a professor at UC Berkeley who's into trying to integrate mathematical models into this to say, to ask questions like, given this level of risk, this coverage of nets, what's the best intervention? What should the program do here? If there's lots of imported infections, does that, does that change things? So we're trying to sort of operationalize and change raw risk into sort of decision or recommendations. And then we're also, uh, we've been very lucky to be granted access to some skybox, high, very high resolution imagery. This is one to two meter resolution imagery. And we're using it to see whether we can identify uh, habitats for mosquito, mosquito larvae. So can we essentially find water bodies at very high resolution? Um, and this is some work. This is just trying to classify those images into, this is NDWI, I think. Uh, but we're going to use a range of different techniques to try to do that and then to validate that information on the ground. But it would be great to think about how we can one day start to include much more high-resolution imagery like this in the platform. And then ultimately, we want to expand. So we are doing this in Swaziland, but we're in conversations with other countries, Zimbabwe and Thailand, about how we can incorporate risk mapping into their platforms as well. And then thinking beyond malaria, can we do this for other diseases? Uh, diseases, a lot of infectious diseases are, uh, have a sort of environmental angle and are controlled by the environment and climate. This is a map of uh, Ebola risk uh, in Africa. Um, and, but there are a range of other diseases that we could apply this technique to, to have a sort of uh, near real-time risk map of diseases. So thank you very much. Um, lots of people to thank, but I'd like to make a particular uh, shout out to Alamayu Medexa, who's uh, my postdoc in the, in the group, who's the brains behind all this. He's been here with us since November, writing all, a lot of this code. So um, a big shout out to you. Thank you. Well, I think that taking the platform to work in, in another place it wouldn't be a big deal, but what about changing the, the, the vector, the disease? Do you need to get different characteristics in order to classify? Or? You mean, so for different diseases, are there different variables that control that disease? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So we have tailored this at the moment to malaria, uh, and we've pulled in those variables that we believe are related to the biology of malaria and of mosquitoes. Uh, so if you're thinking about other diseases, there may be other factors that you would have to do. Yeah. So we wouldn't just be able to stick in just the data and run it. We, we could, and it would show us a risk map. But we would want to think more carefully about the, uh, the, the data that go into it. Yeah. But a lot of that data now is contained in Earth Engine, which is great.